This is chapters 8 through 12 of The Sincere Huron, or L'Angenu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This recording by Roy Schreiber. Chapter 8. The Huron Goes to Court, Sups Upon the Road with Some Huguenots. The ingenuous Hercules took the Samoor road in the coach because that was, at that time, the only conveyance. When he came to Samoor, he was astonished to find the city almost deserted, and see several families going away. He was told that half a dozen years before, Samoor contained upwards of fifty thousand inhabitants, and that at present there were not six thousand. He mentioned this at an inn whilst he stopped. Several Protestants were at table. Some complained bitterly, others trembled with rage. Others weeping said, We abandon our sweet fields, we fly our country. And why do you fly from your country, gentlemen? Because we must otherwise acknowledge the Pope. And why not acknowledge him? Have you no godmothers, then, that you want to marry? For I am told that he is the one that grants this permission. Ah, sir, the Pope says that he is master of the domains of kings. But, gentlemen, what religion are you of? Why, sir, we are for the most part drapers and manufacturers. If the Pope, says he, is the master of your clothes and manufactures, you do very well not to acknowledge him. But as to kings, this is their business, and why do you trouble yourself with it? Here a little black man took up the argument, and very learnedly set forth the grievances of the company. He talked of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes with so much energy. He deplored in so pathetic a manner the fate of fifty thousand fugitive families, and of fifty thousand others converted by dragoons, that the ingenuous Hercules could not refrain from shedding tears. Whence arises, said he, that so great a king, whose renown expands itself even to the Hurons, should thus deprive himself of so many hearts that would have loved him, and so many arms that would have served him? Because he has been imposed upon, like other great kings, replied the little orator, he has been made to believe that as soon as he utters a word all people think as he does, and that he can make us change our religion just as his musician Lully in a moment changes the decorations of his opera. He has not only already lost five or six hundred thousand very useful subjects, but he has turned many of them into enemies, and King William, who is at this time master of England, has composed several regiments of these identical Frenchmen, who otherwise would have fought for their monarch. Such a disaster is the more astonishing, as the present Pope, to whom Louis the Fourteenth sacrifices a part of his people, is his declared enemy. A violent quarrel has subsisted between them for near nine years. It has been carried so far that France was in hopes, at length, of casting off the yoke by which it has been kept in subjugation for so many ages to this foreigner, and, more particularly, of not giving him any more money, which is the prime business of the affairs of this world. It therefore appears evident that this great king has been imposed upon, as well with respect to his interest, as the extent of his power, and that even the magnanimity of his heart has been struck at. The Huron melted more and more, and asked, who were the Frenchmen who thus deceived a monarch so dear to the Hurons? They are the Jesuits, he was answered, and particularly Father Lachaise, the king's confessor. It is to be hoped that God will one day punish them for it, and that they will be driven out, as they now drive us. Can any misfortune equal ours? Monsieur Levois besets us on all sides with Jesuits and dragoons. Well, gentlemen, replied the Huron, who could contain himself no longer. I am going to Versailles to receive the recompense due my services. I will speak to Monsieur de Lavoie. I am told it is he who makes war from his closet. I shall see the king, and I will acquaint him with the truth. It is impossible not to yield to this truth when it is felt. I shall return very soon to marry Mademoiselle St. Ives, and I beg you will be present at our nuptials. These good people now took him for some great lord who travelled incognito in the coach. Some took him for the king's fool. There was at table a disguised Jesuit, who acted as a spy for the Reverend Father de la Chaise. He gave him an account of everything that passed, and Father de la Chaise reported what the spy wrote, 
to M. de Lavoie. The Huron and the letter arrived almost at the same time at Versailles. Chapter 9 The Arrival of the Huron at Versailles the Reception at Court The ingenuous Huron was set down from a pot de chambre, a vehicle that goes from Paris to Versailles which resembles a little covered tumbrel, in the court of the kitchens. He asked the chairman what hour the king can be seen. The chairman laughed in his face just as the English admiral had done, and he treated them in the same manner. He beat them. They were for retaliation, and the scene had liked to have proved bloody. If a life guardsman, who was a gentleman of Brittany, had not passed by and dispersed the mob. Sir, said the traveller to him, you appear to me to be a brave man. I am nephew to the prior of Our Lady of the Mountain. I have killed Englishmen, and I have come to speak to the king. I beg you will conduct me to his chamber. The soldier, ravished to find a man of courage from his province, who did not seem acquainted with the customs of the court, told him that this was not the manner of speaking to the king, that it was necessary to be presented by M. de Lavoie. Very well, then, conduct me to M. Lavoie, who will doubtless conduct me to the king. It is more difficult, resumed the soldier, to speak to M. Lavoie than to the king. But I will conduct you to M. Alexander, first commissioner at war, and this will be just the same as if you spoke to the minister. They accordingly repair to M. Alexander's, who is first clerk, but they cannot be introduced, he being closely engaged in business with a lady of the court, and no person is allowed admittance. Well, said the life guardsman, there is no harm done. Let us go to M. Alexander's first clerk. This will be just the same as if you spoke to M. Alexandre himself. The Huron, quite astonished, followed him. They remained together a half hour in a little antechamber. What is this? said the ingenuous Huron. Is all the world invisible in this country? It is much easier to fight in Lower Brittany against Englishmen than to meet with people at Versailles with whom one hath business. He then amused himself for some time with relating his amours to his countrymen. But the clock striking recalled the soldier to his post, when a mutual promise was given of meeting on the morrow. The Huron remained another half-hour in the antechamber, ruminating upon Mademoiselle St. Ives and the difficulty of speaking to kings and first clerks. At length the patron appeared. Sir, said the ingenuous Hercules, if I had waited to repulse the English as long as you have made me wait for my audience, they would certainly have ravaged all of Lower Brittany without opposition. These words struck the clerk. He at length said to the inhabitant of Brittany, What is your request? A recompense, said the other. These are my titles, showing his certificates. The clerk read, and told him that probably he might obtain leave to purchase a lieutenancy. Me? What? Must I pay money for having repulsed the English? Must I pay a tax to be killed for you, whilst you are peaceably giving your audiences here? You are certainly jesting. I require a company of cavalry for nothing. I require the king shall set Mademoiselle St. Ives at liberty from the convent, and that he give her to me in marriage. I want to speak to the king in favor of fifty thousand families, whom I propose restoring to him. In a word, I want to be useful. Let me be employed and advanced. What is your name, sir, who talk in such a high style? Oh, oh, answered the Huron. You have not then read my certificates? This is the way they are treated? My name is Hercules de Kirkabon. I am christened, and I am lodged at the Blue Dial. The clerk concluded, like the people of Samor, that his head was turned, and did not pay him any further attention. The same day, the Reverend Father de la Chaise, confessor to Louis the Fourteenth, received his spy's letter, which accused the Breton Kirkabon of favoring in his heart the Huguenots and condemning the conduct of the Jesuits. M. de Lavoie had, on his side, received a letter from the inquisitive bailiff, which depicted the Huron as a wicked, lewd fellow inclined to burn convents and carry off the nuns. Hercules, after having walked in the gardens of Versailles, which had become irksome to him, after having supper, like a native of Huronia and Lower Brittany, had gone to rest in the pleasing hope of seeing the king the next day, obtaining Mademoiselle St. Ives in marriage, having, at least, a company of cavalry, and of setting aside the persecution against the Huguenots. He was rocking himself asleep 
with these flattering ideas, when the constables entered his chamber and seized upon his double-charged fusee and his great sabre. They took in an inventory of his ready money, and then conducted him to the castle erected by King Charles V, son of John II, near the street of St. Antoine at the gate of the Tournelles. What was the Huron's astonishment in his way thither the reader is left to imagine? He at first fancied it was all a dream, and remained for some time in a state of stupefaction. Presently transported with rage that gave him more than common strength, he collared two of his conductors who were with him in the coach, flung them out the door, cast himself after them, and then dragged the third who wanted to hold him. He fell in the attempt, and then they tied him up and replaced him in the carriage. This, then, said he, is what one gets for driving the English out of Lower Brittany. What would you say, my charming Mademoiselle St. Ives, if you could see me in this situation? They at length arrived at the place of their destination. He was carried without any noise into the chamber in which he was to be locked up like a dead corpse going into the grave. This room was already occupied by an old solitary student of Port Royal named Gordon, who had been languishing there for two years. See, said the chief of the constables, here is company I bring you, and immediately the enormous bolts on this strong door, secured with large iron bars, were fastened upon them. These two captives were thus separated from all the universe besides. Chapter 10 The Huron is shut up in the Bastille with a Jansenist. Monsieur Gordon was a healthy old man, of serene disposition, who was acquainted with two great things. The one was to bear adversity, the other to console the afflicted. He approached his companion with an open sympathizing air, and said to him, whilst he embraced him, Whoever thou art that is come to partake of my grave, be assured that I shall constantly forget myself to soften your torments in the infernal abyss wherein we are plunged. Let us adore Providence that has conducted us here. Let us suffer in peace and trust in hope. These words had the same effect upon the youth as English drops, which recall a dying person to life, and show to his astonished eyes a glimpse of light. After the first compliments were over, Gordon, without urging him to relate the cause of his misfortune, inspired him by the sweetness of his discourse, and by that interest which two unfortunate persons share with each other, with a desire of opening his heart, and of disburdening himself of the weight which oppressed him. But he could not guess the cause of his misfortune, and the good man Gordon was as much astonished as himself. "'God must doubtless,' said the Jansenist to the Huron, "'have great designs upon you, since he conducted you from Lake Ontario into England, from thence into France, caused you to be baptized in Lower Brittany, and has now lodged you here for your salvation. In faith, says Hercules, I believe the devil alone has interfered in my destiny. My countrymen in America would never have treated me with the barbarity I have experienced. They have not the least idea of it. They are called savages. They are good people, but rustic, and the men of this country are refined villains. I am indeed, said he, greatly surprised to have come from another world to be shut up under four bolts with a priest. But when I consider what an infinite number of men set out from one hemisphere to go and get killed in the other, and are cast away in the voyage, and are eaten by the fishes, I cannot discover the gracious designs of God over all these people. Their dinner was brought them through a wicket. The conversation turned upon providence, letters of cachet, and upon the art of not sinking under disgrace to which all men in this world are exposed. It is two years since I have been here, said the old man, without any other consolation than myself and books, and yet I have never been a single moment out of temper. Ah, Monsieur Gordon, cried Hercules, you are not then in love with your godmother. If you were as well acquainted with Mademoiselle St. Ives as I am, you would be in a state of desperation. At these words he could not refrain from tears, which greatly relieved him from his oppression. How is it, then, that tears solace us? It seems to me that they should have quite the opposite effect. 
My son, said the good old man, everything is physical about us. All secretions are useful to the body, and all that comforts it comforts the soul. We are the machines of providence. The ingenuous Huron, who, as we have already observed more than once, had a great share of understanding, entered deeply into consideration of this idea, the seeds whereof appeared to be within himself, after which he asked his companion why his machine for two years had been confined by four bolts. By effectual grace, answered Gordon, I pass for a Jansenist. I know Arnaud and Nicole, the Jesuits, have persecuted us. We believe that the Pope is nothing more than a bishop, like another, and therefore Father Lachaise has obtained from the king his penitent, an order for robbing me without any justice, of the most precious inheritance of man, liberty. This is strange, said the Huron. All the unhappy people I have met with have been made solely by the Pope. With respect to your effectual grace, I acknowledge I do not understand what you mean, but I consider it as a great favor that God has let me, in my misfortune, meet a man who pours into my heart such consolations as I thought myself incapable of receiving. The conversation became each day more interesting and instructive. The souls of the two captives seemed to unite in one body. The old man knew a great deal, and the young man was willing to acquire much instruction. At the end of the first month he eagerly applied himself to the study of geometry. Gordon made him read Raoul's Physics, which book was still in fashion, and he had good sense enough to find in it nothing but doubts and uncertainties. He afterwards read the first volume of the Inquiry After Truth. This instructive work gave him new light. What? said he. Does our imagination and our senses deceive us to that degree? What? Are not our ideas formed by objects? Can we not acquire them by ourselves? When he had gone through the second volume, he was not so well satisfied, and he concluded it was much easier to destroy than to build. His colleague, astonished that a young ignoramus should make such a remark, conceived a very high opinion of his understanding, and was more strongly attached to him. Your Malabranche, said he to Gordon one day, seems to have written half his book whilst in possession of his reason, and the other half in the assurance only of imagination and prejudice. Some days after, Gordon asked him what he thought of the soul, and the manner in which we receive our ideas, of volition, grace, and free agency. Nothing, replied the Huron. If I think something, it is that we are under the power of the eternal being, like the stars and the elements, that he operates everything in us, that we are small wheels of an immense machine, of which he is the soul, that he acts according to general law, and not from particular views. This is all that appears to me intelligible. All the rest is to me a dark abyss. But this, my son, would be making God the author of sin. But, Father, your effectual grace would equally make him the author of sin. For certainly all those to whom his grace was refused would sin, and not he who gives up to evil the author of evil. This sincerity greatly embarrassed the good old man. He found that all his endeavors to extricate himself from this quagmire were ineffectual, and he heaped such quantities of words upon the other, which seemed to have meaning, but which in fact had none, in the style of physical premotion, that the Huron could not help pitying him. This question evidently determined the origin of good and evil, and poor Gordon was reduced to the necessity of returning to Pandora's box. Orsamedes' egg pierced by Aramaeni, the enmity between Typhoon and Osiris, and at last original sin, and these he grouped together in profound darkness, without throwing the least glimmering of light upon one another. However, this romance of the soul diverted their thoughts from the contemplation of their own misery, and by a strange magic the multitude of calamities dispersed throughout the world diminished the sensation of their own miseries. They did not dare complain when all mankind was in a state of sufferance. But in the repose of night, the image of the charming Mademoiselle St. Ives effaced from the mind of her lover, 
every metaphysical and moral idea. He awoke with his eyes bathed in tears, and the old Jansenist forgot his effectual grace, and the Abbe St. Cyran, and Jansenius himself, to allow consolation to a youth whom he judged guilty of a mortal sin. After their lectures, and their reasonings were over, their adventures furnished them with subjects of conversation, and after this store was exhausted, they read together or separately. The Huron's understanding daily increased, and he would certainly have made great progress in mathematics if the thoughts of Mademoiselle St. Ives had not frequently distracted him. He read histories, which made him melancholy. The world appeared to him too wicked and too miserable. In fact, history is nothing more than a picture of crimes and misfortunes. The crowd of innocent and peaceable men are always invisible upon this vast theater. The dramatis personae are composed of ambitious, perverse men. The pleasure which history affords is derived from the same source as tragedy, which would languish and become insipid were it not inspired by strong passions, great crimes, and piteous misfortunes. Clio must be armed with a poignard as well as Mel Ponet. Though the history of France is not less filled with horrors than those of other nations, it nevertheless appeared to him so disgusting in the beginning, so dry in the continuation, and so trifling in the end, even in the time of Henry the Fourth, ever destitute of monuments, or foreign to those fine discoveries which have illuminated other nations, that he was obliged to resolve upon not being tired to go through all the particulars of obscure calamities confined to a little corner of the world. Gordon thought like him. They both laughed with pity when they read of the sovereigns of Fiesensax and Fiesensagut and Astrict. Such a study could be relished only by their heirs, if they had any. The brilliant ages of Roman Republic made him sometimes quite indifferent as to any other part of the globe. The spectacle of victorious Rome, the lawgiver of nations, engrossed his whole soul. He glowed in contemplating a people who governed for seven hundred years by the enthusiasm of liberty and glory. Thus rolled days, weeks, and months, and he would have thought himself happy in the sanctuary of despair if, it had, if he had not loved. The natural goodness of his heart softened still more when he reflected upon the prior of Our Lady of the Mountain and the sensible Kirkabon. What must they think, he would often repeat, when they can get no tidings of me? They must think me an ungrateful wretch. This idea rendered him inconsolable. He pitied those who loved him much more than he pitied himself. CHAPTER Eleven: HOW THE HURON DISCLOSES HIS GENIUS Reading aggrandizes the soul, and an enlightened friend affords consolation. Our captive had these two advantages in his favor, which he had never expected. I shall begin to believe in metamorphosis, for I have been transformed from a brute into a man. He formed a chosen library with part of the money which was allowed him to dispose of. His friend encouraged him to commit to writing such observations as occurred to him. These are his notes upon ancient history. I imagine that nations were for a long time like myself, that they did not become enlightened till very late, that for many ages they were occupied with nothing but the present moment which elapsed, that they thought very little of what passed and never of the future. I have traversed five or six hundred leagues in Canada, and I do not meet with any single monument not one in any way acquainted with the actions of his predecessors. Is it not the natural state of man? The human species of this continent appear to me superior to that of the other. They have extended their being for many ages by arts and knowledge. Is it because they have beards upon their chin, and God has refused this ornament to the Americans? I do not believe it, for I find the Chinese have very little beard and that they have cultivated arts for upwards of five thousand years. In effect, if their annals go back for four thousand years, the nation must necessarily have been united and in a flourishing state more than five hundred centuries. One thing particularly strikes me 
in this ancient history of china which is that almost everything is probable and natural i admire it because it is not tinctured with anything of the miraculous why have all other nations adopted fabulous origins the ancient chroniclers of the history of france who by the by are not very ancient make the french descended from one francus the son of hector the romans said they were the issue of a phrygian though there was not in their whole language a single word that had the least connection with the language of phrygia the gods had inhabited egypt for ten thousand years and the devil's scythia where they engendered the huns i meet with nothing before thucydides romances similar to amadeus's and far less amusing apparitions oracles prodigies sorceries metamorphoses are interspersed throughout with the explanation of dreams which are the bases of the destiny of the greatest empires and the smallest states here are speaking beasts there brutes that are adored gods transformed into men and men into gods if we must have fables let us at least have such as appear the emblem of truth i admire the fables of philosophers but i laugh at those of children and i hate those of impostors one day he hit upon the history of the emperor justinian it was there related that some apodutes of constantinople had delivered in very bad greek an edict against the greatest captain of the age because this hero had uttered the following words in the warmth of conversation truth shines forth with its proper light and people's minds are not illuminated by flaming piles the apodutes declared that this proposition was heretical bordering on heresy and that the contrary action was catholic universal and grecian the minds of people are not enlightened but with flaming piles and truth cannot shine forth with its own light these linistolians thus condemned several discourses of the captain and published an edict what said the huron with much emotion shall such people publish edicts they are not edicts replied gordon they are contradictions which all the world laughed at in constantinople and the emperor the first he was a wise prince who knew how to reduce the linistolian apodides to a state incapable of doing anything but good he knew that these gentlemen and several other pastifores had tried the patience of the emperors his predecessors with contradictions in more serious matters he did very right said the huron the pastifores should be supported and constrained he committed several other observations to paper which astonished old gordon what said he to himself have i consumed fifty years in instruction and i fear i have not attained to the degree of natural good sense of this child who is almost a savage i tremble to think i have so arduously strengthened prejudice and he listens to simple nature only the good man had some little books of criticism some of those periodical pamphlets were in men incapable of producing anything themselves blacken the productions of others where a visay insults racine a fait fenelon the huron ran over some of them i compare them to certain gnats that lodge their eggs in the posteriors of the finest horses which do not however prevent their running the two philosophers scarce deigned to cast their eyes upon these excrements of literature they soon after went through the elements of astronomy the huron sent for some globes he was ravished at this great spectacle how hard it is said he that i should only begin to be acquainted with heaven when the power of contemplating it is ravished from me jupiter and saturn revolve in these immense spaces millions of suns illuminate myriads of worlds and in this corner of the earth whither i am cast there are beings that deprive me of seeing and thinking of those worlds whither my eye might reach and even that in which god created me the light created for the whole universe is lost to me it is not hidden from me in the northern hem horizon where i passed my infancy and youth without you 
my dear Gordon, I should be annihilated. Chapter 12. The Huron Sentiments Upon Theatrical Pieces The young Huron resembled one of those vigorous trees which planted in an ungrateful soil extends in a little time its root and branches when transferred to a more favorable spot, and it was extraordinary that this favorable spot should be a prison. Among the books which employed the leisure of the two captives were some poems, and the translation of Greek tragedies, and some dramatic pieces in French. Those passages that dwelt on love communicated at once pleasure and pain to the soul of the Huron. They were but so many images of his dear Mademoiselle St. Ives. The fable of the two pigeons rent his heart, but he was far estranged from his tender dove. Moliere enchanted him. He taught him the manners of Paris and of human nature. To which of his comedies do you give the preference? Doubtless to Tartuffe. I am of your opinion, said Gordon. It was a Tartuffe that flung me into this dungeon, and perhaps they were Tartuffes who have been the cause of your misfortunes. What do you think of these Greek tragedies? They are very good for Grecians. But when he read the modern Ephigenia, Phaedrus, Andromache, and Othella, he was in ecstasy. He sighed, he wept, and he learned them by heart without having any such intention. Read Rodogun, said Gordon. That is said to be a capital production. The other pieces which have given you so much pleasure are trifles compared to this. The young man had scarce got through the first page before he said, This is not written by the same author. How do you know it? I know nothing yet, but these lines touch neither my ear nor my heart. Oh, said Gordon, the versification does not signify. The Huron asked, What must I judge by then? After having read the piece very attentively, without any other design than being pleased, he looked steadfastly at his friend with astonishment, not knowing what to say. At length, being urged to give his opinion with respect to what he felt, this was the answer he made. I understood very little of the beginning, the middle disgusted me, but the last scene greatly moved me, though there appears to me but little probability in it. I have no prejudices for or against any one, but I do not remember twenty lines, I who recollect them all when they please me. This piece, nevertheless, passes for the best upon our stage. If that be the case, said he, it is perhaps like many people who are not worthy of the places they hold. After all, this is a matter of taste, and mine cannot yet be formed. I may be mistaken. But you know I am accustomed to say what I think, or rather what I feel. I suspect that illusion, fashion, and caprice often warp the judgments of men. Here he repeated some lines from Ephigenia, which he was full of, and though he declaimed them but indifferently, he uttered them with such truth and sensation that he made the old Jansenist weep. He then read Cinna, which did not excite his tears but his ad admiration. The end of chapters 8 through 12.